That was just dynamic. It was just dynamic. So we actually have um, a nice amount of time for questions and answers. If you could please uh, write down your questions and then pass them to the outside. Um, to the outsides, people will get them on either sides of, of the aisles. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Kumea Shorta Gooden, who is the uh, Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer here at the University of Maryland. Uh, while people are passing questions down, I'll go ahead and start with, with one question. Uh, in thinking about these investments in, in racialism that oftentimes run counter to uh, our supposedly investments in being post-racial, I'm thinking about this in the context of so both of your talks. Dr. Bowman, when you talked about uh, race, reactionary racism, individual deficits, and cultural pathological stereotypes, all of them significantly mattered in, in the models that you presented. So, so how do we change the attitudes and is there potentially one set of ideologies that we should concentrate on? Or should this even be the focus? And instead, should we more directly focus on multi-ethnic empowerment in the context of thinking about the relationships between uh, micro-level attitudes and macro-level policy change, right? So this is me sort of thinking about um, how will people reconcile the pursuits to potentially do both? Is it important to do both? Um, does one potentially not matter as much as the other? So how do we kind of think about those pursuits as we move toward uh, striving toward racial, racial change in the 21st century? So I think both of you are one of them. I'm yeah. Able to comment. Yeah, yeah, come on. Uh, and it's a good question. And I think one of the, if, if one were to raise this question of contemporary racism independent of those other contexts, then the answer would be, that we work on changing individual attitudes, right? You know, that you change uh, people's beliefs, you know, about those different components of contemporary racism. I think this 21st century racism argument would say that two things. One, that you have to deal with all levels, you know, because they reinforce each other. Uh, and that if you're going to start with just one, you start at the national policy level, because it requires people to do things at the other levels. If you change public policy at the national level, that has to be implemented through organizations and impact individuals. You know, so uh, within that kind of multi-level framing, that would be you know, the kind of two uh, kind of logical responses. So OK, so th this will be a kind of, kind of following up on this. For, for Dr. Jackson, someone asked, as part of large um, institutions, large structures and systems that historically and currently further exclude uh, and kind of create racism, how do you know that you're interrupting it? What does it look like? What does it feel like when you're, um, and I think interruption is, a, is, a, is an interesting word to use for this particular question. Oftentimes, I mean like in the previous questions, I just said change. But instead, this person is asking, what happens when you interrupt it? Right, when you stop it and make people pause, what does it feel like? What does it look like? How do you know that you're actually doing that? I'm notoriously bad with Q&A, because these <laughs> questions are tough. I mean, I, I, I don't have a pithy answer, I don't think. I think what I'll say is, I want to imagine that at the very least, to interrupt effectively um, means that everyone involved, everyone in that context, actually has to take a second, has to pause a little bit and re-examine some of their assumptions, right? So, so what I always feel like is important is it starts with this, for me at least, starts with the premise that anything we do is going to have both short-term consequences and hopefully, if we're lucky, maybe positive long-term consequences. But we, we somewhat, in some ways can't determine either. We can try to think about both at the same time. And I think a notion of an interruption is one that says, at least for that moment, for however fleeting it is, we're able to look at the stuff we've seen every day and in some ways look at it with new eyes and think about it a little bit differently. You know, I think an interruption works if after it's done, the interrupters and the interrupted actually can begin to have a differently framed register for the conversation that can continue to have with others. So hopefully, again, I don't know how long it lasts. And interruption, I think, is a wonderful term because it, it, it reminds us that it's hard to make real systematic change. right? You have these small victories. And sometimes the small victory is going to have to be enough for now. But I think the key is to know that we're always trying to figure out how we channel some of that 
more sort of ephemeral effectiveness we might have in a particular space to get someplace we feel like we haven't gotten before and to connect with someone in ways we haven't before and sort of scale that up, as it were. And I think the key is to know those are very different kinds of projects that probably take different skill sets, too. Um, but I think the key is to know it should start with you. You should be thinking differently, right? It, should be, it shouldn't be a one-way street. Right? So it's not just me interrupting and all of a sudden the folks I'm with have this transformation experience. It's about realizing that if you're not changing in the process, then something's not working, at least not completely. So I think it starts there with this kind of sort of self-reflective notion. I'm going to kind of pair a couple of questions because even though they may seem that they're not that, that related, I think that, that in some ways it may come together in some ways. So on one hand, uh, one person asks, can you speak to the quote unquote love that the media has been recently showing to black celebrities? Uh, Charles Barkley is one in particular, Bill Cosby and Pharrell, who, who have been denouncing black underachievement, right? And how do we think about that? And then another person asks, um, for, for Dr. Bowman, I noticed that in the study of university students, Asian American students have very high rates of believing in racist ideologies. Um, in some cases, even higher than, higher than white students. Do you have any thoughts about this? What can Asian American student leaders do to dispel these racist ideas in our community? So in many ways, it's picking up on one hand, uh, blacks and more affluent blacks, more wealthy blacks in the media talking in one particular way, but then also Asians and Asian students uh, kind of representing Asian Americans in terms of talking about uh, racism and having similar attitudes? Well, someone did look at the slides in some detail, didn't they? Um, it, it, it is a very, very good question. I think you juxtaposing those racial ethnic differences on the first question that really was about class differences within the African American population is uh, linked to, uh, you know, my general, you know, uh, rather objective response to it. That is, that the interesting thing, you know, we oftentimes, and this is going to be a little controversial, you know, talks about, talk about racism as, you know, you can't have racism if you don't have any power, right? Well, Carter G. Woodson wrote a book called The Miseducation of the Negro, which, which a long time ago, which suggested that you can't oppress people unless they internalize the racism. They become racist. Not because they have power, but they give their power up. Right? You know, now that's a, that's a flip on it, not suggesting that, you know, we're talking about the structural, institutional versus uh, structural racism and the fact that at the end of the day is who holds the hegemonic power. I'm, I'm not debating that one. But I am suggesting that what we really, would the implicit in that question, is the degree to which this is not a random sample of Asian students in this data set. If you were to get low income Asian students and ask them who were not as successful, I'm not sure you get the same response. Likewise, if you did analysis of affluent blacks and very and blacks in poverty, would you get the same response? You know, so some of this is about privilege. And I can't relate to that. Because I've never had that problem. <laughs> Therefore, I kind of see what they mean. Get up and work, get a job, because I got one. Right? You know, so it shows up in the racial and ethnic comparisons to make the Asian students look like they have higher levels of contemporary racism. And they probably do. But if you did analysis of the African American students, the ones more privileged would have a higher level of what? Contemporary racism. You know, so in some of it, it's internalizing those mainstream views because I can't relate to the experience of those individuals who are at the lower end of the inequality that makes this contemporary racism a very complex phenomenon. So, so thinking about, uh, some person asked about the ways in which art interrupts the ways in which we think about 
race in America. And in particular, someone else mentioned the new movie, uh, Dear yes, Dear White People, as kind of part of that. And, and, part, and what they particularly ask, is this a new piece of kind of going deeper and engaging the discussion about race, or does it simply go deeper um, into individuals' uh, existing attitudes, into their existing psyche about racial difference, uh, possibly even culturally, possibly not even genetically, but possibly culturally, about motivation? Um, and kind of, can you speak on that? So I, I haven't actually seen Dear White People, but everyone's watching it. Um, so at some point, I will get a chance to look at it. Um, there, there's been a whole bunch of research, I think really interesting yeah. research, on the history of critical representations of and engagements with race and racism, even specifically slavery, in the history of chattel slavery, um, in the arts. Right? And that's from African-American artists, Afro-diasporic artists, and others. So I think this is part of a long tradition, not necessarily a break from one. Um, I think what's, what's nice about the contemporary moment is they're trying to deal with the landscape that looks different from the landscape, say, of the 1970s and 80s. So that's why the art and its sort of specificities will be different. But I think it's part of a longer tradition than a lot of people study, um, including folks in this room who teach at this university. Um, so and the second point I make really, really quickly is I do feel like part of what we're trying to figure out now is exactly how much responsibility to put on individual actors in, this, in the context of these the media um, fan discussions about the pathologized urban poor. And how much of it is about us disentangling the sort of media's power from the individual perspective of specific subjects. So I do know, for instance, um, just as one example, you know, people have made a lot of Barack Obama's move to very carefully critique a certain version of sort of African-American um, sort of non-normativity in the family. He's done that many times. Right? He's done that in ways that the media has found quite interesting and egregious. The Barkley stuff is new. I just heard about that this morning. Um, and of course, Bill Cosby was kind of notorious, not just because of what he said. And some of these people always will, will tell you, and I think they're mostly right, you know, you go almost across this class spectrum and you'll hear versions of the same kind of critique. I think often what was so disturbing was it was almost kind of the level of venom and vitriol in the discourse, right? And, and, and there's something about that. Glenn Lowry, a long time ago, I think made this really wonderful attempt to, to get Americans to understand that part of what defines our public conversation is the, the line we carve between us's and them's. Right? And so if, 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 it, if an issue is an us issue, right, America's mobilized differently than if it's a them issue over there. And I think there's, there's something about the othering that some of this discourse represents that is about class being used. I mean, in, in the new book, um, uh, Impolite Conversations, I, 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 go off, I go on and on about how much I dislike jazz. Mm -hmm. so, and if, for a black, black academic to say, I say I hate jazz, right? That's sacrilegious, right? Jazz is it, and I don't really hate jazz as a musical form, but I hate the way jazz is one example of how culture and elite forms of culture, it wasn't always elite, right? Um, but how elite, relatively elite forms of culture get used as a bludgeon instrument in class warfare vis-a-vis -vis black America, right? So jazz becomes this thing you can mobilize as a way to distinguish a, a class-based version of a racialized us from thems over there that aren't as cultured, aren't as sophisticated, right? aren't as educated. So I think that's the part of it that people, at least I find most um, discomforting, is that there's a way in which the discourse could, again, very common things people say all the time, almost irrespective of class. But Lowry reminds us there are ways to say it that locates it over there, right, and different from what you have to deal with versus ways that locate it discursively within your own social and cultural universe. It demands a different kind of commitment and relationship to the problematic. All right, now uh, Dr. Mahmoudi is going to come back up and close our program. I'm sorry to stop this, but Dr. Bowman has to catch a plane. So <laughs> I would like to, again, thank our speakers today for two very profound, beautiful lectures. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that 
th this is a continuation of the discourse on this very important topic. And we hope soon, Dr. Bray and I are trying to um, work on this, to perhaps publish uh, either a journal article or a book uh, that so far, whatever we have covered so far in relation to the guest speakers we've had, would be published in that. So hopefully you can also see it in that context. Um, I wanted to just bring to your attention before I end this program that on your programs uh, on your desk, you, uh, on your chair, sorry, you saw that there are a couple of programs coming up. Um, Nadim, I can't access. It's locked. Oh, okay. So it, just to tell you, Solidarity Across Differences is another series that the Baha'i Chair holds. And uh, on November 12th, we have our symposium in which Dr. Rayshawn Ray will present and uh, Dr. She's in the audience as well, Dr. Beth Cohen. Uh, both of them will be giving uh, presentations about this very important topic of solidarity across differences. And in, um, in the end of November, November 24th, we'll have uh, Professor Fuma Zaks uh, speaking about women in conflicts, past and present, the Syrian case. So we hope that you will come back and uh, learn some more about these very important issues that we are all confronted with. Again, I wanted to thank our speakers for being with us today. They've traveled far, and one of them drove today, so we really appreciate your being here today. Thank you very much.